Chapter Twenty Five, The Seventh Ward. For a long moment, High Lord Elena gripped the staff of law and glared down at him. Focus crackled on the verge of her gaze. It was about to lash out and scourge him. But then she seemed to recollect who he was. Slowly, the passion dimmed in her face, went behind an inward veil. She lowered herself to her seat in the boat. Quietly, dangerously, she asked, "All this? Do you ask what Lord Fowl gains from what I have told you?" He answered her with quivering promptitude. Careless now of the illimitable range of implications with which the echoes multiplied his voice, he hastened to explain himself, ameliorate at least in this way the falseness of his position. That too, you said it yourself. That old unsufferable bargain I made with the Ranihin put you where you are. Never mind what I did to your mother. That too. But it's really this time I'm talking about. You summoned me, and we're on our way to the seventh ward. And I want to know what Fowl gets out of it. He wouldn't waste a chance like this. This is no part of his intent," she replied coldly. "The choice to summon you was mine, not his. Right. That's the way he works." But what made you decide to summon me? I mean, aside from the fact that you were going to call me anyway at some time or other, because I have the simple misfortune to wear a white gold wedding ring and have two fingers missing. What made you decide then, when you did? Duke Wayne him gave us new knowledge of Fang Thane's power. New knowledge by hell, Covenant croaked. Do you think that was an accident? Fowl released him. He shouted the word "released," and its echoes jabbered about him like dire significances. He released that poor suffering devil because he knew exactly what you would do about it, and he wanted me to be in the land then, at that precise time, not sooner or later. The importance of what he was saying penetrated her. She began to hear him seriously. But her voice remained non-committal as she asked, "Why? How are his purposes served?" For a moment, he shied away from what he was thinking. How should I know? If I knew, I might be able to fight it somehow. Aside from the idea that I'm supposed to destroy the land, but Elena's grave attention stopped him. For her sake, he mustered his courage. Well, look at what's happened because of me. I did something to Lorix Krill. Therefore, a muck showed up. Therefore, you're going to try to unlock the seventh ward. It's as neat as clockwork. If you'd summoned me sooner, then when we got to this point, you wouldn't be under such pressure to use lore you don't understand. And if all this had happened later, you wouldn't have come here at all. You'd have been too busy fighting the war. As for me, he swallowed and looked away for an instant, then took a step closer to the root of his bargain. This is the only way I can possibly get off the hook. If things had gone differently, there would have been a lot more pressure on me from everywhere to learn how to use this ring. And Joan, by this way, you've been distracted. You're thinking about the seventh ward instead of wild magic or whatever, and Fall doesn't want me to learn what white gold is good for. I might use it against him. Don't you see it? Fall put us where we are. He released Duca so that you would be right here now. He must have a reason. He likes to destroy people through the things that make them hope. That way, he can get them to desecrate. No wonder this is the dark of the moon. He was poignantly conscious of the way in which he endangered his own cause as he concluded softly, "Elena, the seventh ward might be the worst thing that has happened yet."
but she had her answer ready. No, beloved, I do not believe it. High Lord Kevin formed his wards in a time before his wisdom fell into despair. Fang Thane's hand is not in them. It may be that the power of command is perilous, but it is not ill. Her statement did not convince him, but he did not have the heart to protest. The echoes placed too much stress on even his simplest words. Instead, he sat gazing morosely at her feet, while he scratched at the itch of his wedding band. As the echoes died, as the boat slid gently to a stop in the water, he felt that he had missed a chance for rectitude. For a time, no voice arose to move the boat. Covenant and Elena sat in silence, studying their private thoughts. But then she spoke again. Softly, reverently, she recited the words of Lord Kevin's lament. The boat glided onward again. Shortly the craft rounded another column, and Covenant found himself staring at a high, sparkling, silent waterfall ahead. Its upper reaches disappeared into the shadows of the cavern ceiling, but the torrents which poured noiselessly down its ragged surface caught the fiery rock light at thousands of bright points, so that the falls looked like a cascade of hot, rich red gems. The boat flowed smoothly on Elena's recitation towards a rock levee at one side of the waterfall, and slid up into place. At once a muck leaped from the craft and stood waiting for his companions on the edge of earth root. But for a moment they did not follow him. They sat spellbound by the splendor and silence of the falls. Come, High Lord, the youth said. The seventh ward is nigh. I must bring my being to an end. His tone matched the unwanted seriousness of his countenance. Elena shook her head vaguely, as if she were remembering her limitations, her weariness and lack of knowledge. And Covenant covered his eyes to block out the disconcerting noiseless tumble and glitter of the falls. But then Marin stepped up onto the levee and Elena followed him with a sigh. Gripping the gunnels with both hands, Covenant climbed out of the craft. When Banner joined them, the High Lord's party was complete. Amuck regarded them soberly. He seemed to have aged during the boat ride. The cheeriness had faded from his face, leaving his ancient bones uncontradicted. His lips moved as if he wished to speak. But he said nothing. Like a man looking for support, he gazed briefly at each of his companions. Then he turned away, went with an oddly heavy step towards the waterfall. When he reached the first wet rocks, he scrambled up them and stepped into the plunging water. With his legs widely braced against the weight of the falls, he looked back towards his companions. Do not fear, he said through the silent torrent. This is merely water as you have known it. Earth root's potency springs from another source. Come. With a beckoning gesture, he disappeared under the falls. At this, Elena stiffened. The nearness of the seventh ward filled her face. Discarding her fatigue, she hastened behind Marin towards the waterfall. Covenant followed her. Racked, weary, full of uncomprehending dread, he nevertheless could not hang back now. As Elena pushed through the cascade and passed out of sight, he thrust himself up the wet jumble of rocks, began to crouch towards the falls. Spray dashed into his face. The rocks were too slick for him. He was forced to crawl but he kept moving to evade Banner's help. Holding his breath, he burrowed into the water as if it were an avalanche. It almost flattened him. It pounded him like the accumulated weight of his delusion. But as he propped himself up against it, as the falls drenched him, filled his eyes and mouth and ears, he felt some of its vitality. 
It attacked him like an involuntary ablution, a cleansing performed as the last prerequisite of the power of command. It scrubbed at him as if it meant to peel his bones. But the water force missed his face and chest. It laid bare all his nerves, but failed to purify the marrow of his unfitness. A moment later, he crawled raw and untransmogrified into the darkness beyond the waterfall. Quivering, he shook his head, blew the water out of his mouth and nose. His hands told him that he was on flat stone, but it felt strange, both dry and slippery. It resisted solid contact with his palms, and he could see nothing, hear no scuffles or whispers from his companions. But his sense of smell reacted violently. He found himself in an air so laden with force that it submerged every other odor of his life. It swamped him like the stink of gangrene, burned him like the reek of brimstone, but it bore no resemblance to these or any other smells he knew. It was like the polished massive expanse of earth root, like the immensity of the rock-lit cavern, like the continual adumbrated weight of the waterfall, like the echoes, like the deathless stability of Melancurian Skyweir. It reduced his restless consciousness to the scale of mere brief flesh, it was the smell of earth power. He could not stand it. He was on his knees before it, with his forehead pressed against the cold stone and his hands clasped over the back of his neck. Then he heard a low flaring noise as Elena lit the staff of law. Slowly he raised his head. The sting of the air filled his eyes with tears, but he blinked at them and looked about him. He was in a tunnel which ran straight and lightless away from the falls. Down its center, out of the distance into the falls, flowed a small stream less than a yard wide. Even in the staff's blue light, the fluid of this stream was as red as fresh blood. But it was the source of the smell, the source of Earthroot's dangerous potency. He could see its concentrated might. He pushed to his feet scrambled towards the tunnel wall. He wanted to get as far as possible from the stream. His boot slipped on the black stone floor as if it were glazed with ice. He had to struggle to keep his balance. But he reached the wall, pressed himself against it. Then he looked towards Elena. She was gazing, as if with bated breath down the tunnel. A rapt, exultant expression filled her face, and she seemed taller, elevated in stature by her grasp on the staff of law. As if the staff's flame fed a fire within her, a blaze like a vision of victory. She looked like a priestess, an enactor of hallowed and effective rites, approaching the occult ground of her strength. The very gaps of her elsewhere gaze were crowded with exalted and savage possibilities. They made Covenant forget the uncomfortable power of the air, forget the tears which ran down from his eyes like weeping, and step forward to warn her. At once he lost his footing, barely managed to avoid a fall. Before he could try again, he heard a muck say, Come, the end is at hand. The youth's speech sounded as spectral as an invocation of the dead, and High Lord Elena started down the tunnel in answer to his summons. Quickly Covenant looked around, found Banner behind him. He caught hold of Banner's arm, as if he meant to demand, Stop her! Don't you see what she's going to do? But he could not say it. He had made a bargain. Instead, he thrust away, tried to hurry after Elena. He could find no purchase for his feet. His boots skidded off the stone. He seemed to have lost his sense of balance. But he scrabbled grimly onward. With an intense effort of will, he relaxed the force of his strides, 
pushed less sharply against the ground. As a result, he gained some control over his movements, contrived to keep pace with the High Lord. But he could not catch her. And he could not watch where she was going. His steps required too much concentration. He did not look up until the assailing odor took a leap which almost reduced him to his knees again. Tears flooded his eyes so heavily that they felt irretrievably blurred, bereft of focus. But the smell told him that he had reached the spring of the red stream. Through his tears he could see Elena's flame guttering. He squeezed the water out of his eyes, gained a moment in which to make out his surroundings. He stood behind Elena in a wider cave at the tunnel's end. Before him, set into the black stone end wall like an exposed load facet, was a rough sloping plain of wet rock. This whole plain shimmered. Its emanations distorted his ineffectual vision, gave him the impression that he was staring at a mirage, a wavering in the solid stuff of existence. It confronted him like a porous membrane in the foundation of time and space. From top to bottom, it bled moisture which dripped down the slope, collected in a rude trough, and flowed away along the center of the tunnel. Behold, a muck said quietly, Behold the blood of the earth. Here I fulfilled the purpose of my creation. I am the seventh ward of High Lord Kevin's lore. The power to which I am the way and the door is here. As he spoke, his voice deepened and emptied, grew older. The weary burden of his years bent his shoulders. When he continued, he seemed conscious of a need for haste, a need to speak before his old immunity to time ran out. High Lord, attend. The air of this place unbinds me. I must complete my purpose now. Then speak, Amok, she replied. I hear you. Ah, here, said Amok in a sad, musing tone, as if her answer had dropped him into a reverie. Where is the good of hearing if it is not done wisely? Then he recollected himself. In a stronger voice he said, But here then, for good or ill, I fulfill the law of my creation. My Maker can require no more of me. High Lord, behold the blood of the earth. This is the passionate and essential ichor of the mountain rock, the earth power which raises and holds peaks high. It bleeds here perhaps because the great weight of Melancurian skyweir squeezes it from the dense rock, or perhaps because the mountain is willing to lay bare its heart's blood for those who need and can find it. Whatever the cause, its result remains. Any soul who drinks of the earth blood gains the power of command. He met her intense gaze and went on. The power is rare and potent and full of hazard. Once it has been taken from the blood, it must be used swiftly, lest its strength destroy the drinker, and none can endure more than a single draught. No mortal thew and bone can endure more than a single swallow of the blood. It is too rare a fluid for any cup of flesh to hold. Yet such hazards do not explain why High Lord Kevin himself did not essay the power of command for this power is the power to achieve any desired act, to issue any command to the stone and soil and grass and wood and water and flesh of life, and see that command fulfilled. If any drinker were to say to Melancurian Skyweir, crumble and fall, the great peaks would instantly obey. If any drinker were to say to the fire lions of Mount Thunder, leave your bare slopes, attack and lay waste rigid foam, they would at once strive with all their strength to obey. This power can achieve anything which lies within the scope of the commanded. 
yet High Lord Kevin did not avail himself of it. I don't know all the purposes which guided his heart when he chose to leave the earth blood untasted. But I must explain, if I can, the deeper hazards of the power of command. Amok spoke in a tone of deepening spectral hollowness, and Covenant listened desperately, as if he were clinging with raw, bruised fingers to the precipice of Amok's words. Hot things hammered in his veins, and tears like rivulets of fire ran unstaunchably down his sweating cheeks. He felt that he was suffocating on the smell of earth blood. His ring itched horribly. He could not keep his balance. His footing constantly oozed from under him. Yet his perceptions went beyond all this. His flooded senses stretched, as if they were at last thrusting their heads above water. As Amuk spoke of deeper hazards, Covenant became aware of a new implication in the cave. Through the brunt of the blood, he began to smell something wrong, something ill. It crept insidiously across the whelming odor like an oblique defiance which seemed to succeed in spite of the immense force which it opposed, undercut, betrayed. But he could not locate its source. Either the power of command itself was in some way false, or the wrong was elsewhere, making itself apparent slowly through the dense air. He could not tell which. No one else appeared to notice the subtle reek of ill. After a short, tired pause, a muck continued his explication. The first of these hazards, first, but perhaps not foremost, is the one great limit of the power. It holds no sway over anything which is not a natural part of the Earth's creation. Thus it is not possible to command the despiser to cease his warring. It is not possible to command his death. He lived before the arch of time was forged. The power cannot compel him. This alone might have given Kevin pause. Perhaps he did not drink of the blood because he could not conceive how to levy any command against the despiser. But there is another and subtler hazard. Here any soul with the courage to drink may give a command, but there are few who can foresee the outcome of what they have enacted. When such immeasurable force is unleashed upon the earth, any accomplishment may recoil upon its accomplisher. If a drinker were to command the destruction of the ill earth stone, Perhaps the stone's evil would survive uncontained to blight the whole land. Here the drinker who is not also a prophet risks self-betrayal. Here are possibilities of desecration, which even High Lord Kevin in his despair left slumbering and untouched. The stench of wrong grew in Covenant's nostrils, but still he could not identify it and he could not concentrate on it. He had a question which he fevered to ask Amok. But the tenebrous atmosphere clogged his throat, stifled him. While Covenant struggled for breath, something happened to Amok. During his speech, his tone had become older and more cadaverous, and now in the pause after his last sentence he suddenly lurched, as if some taut cord within him snapped. He staggered a step towards the trough of blood. A moment passed before he could straighten his stance, raise his head again. A look of fear, or pain, or grief widened his eyes, and around them lines of age spread visibly, as if his skin were being crumpled. The soft flesh of his cheeks eroded, Gray ran through his hair. Like a dry sponge, he soaked up his natural measure of years. When he spoke again, his voice was weak and empty. I can say no more. My time is ended. Farewell, High Lord. 
do not fail the land. Convulsively, Covenant gasped out his question, What about the white gold? Amok answered across a great gulf of age, White gold exists beyond the arch of time. It cannot be commanded. Another inward snapping shook him. He jerked closer to the trough. Help him! croaked Covenant. But Elena only raised the staff of law in a mute, fiery salute. With an age-palsied exertion, Amuck thrust himself erect. Tears ran through the wrinkled lattice of his cheeks as he lifted his face towards the roof of the cave and cried in a stricken voice, Ah, Kevin, life is sweet, and I have lived so short a time. Must I pass away? A third snapping shuddered him like an answer to his appeal. He stumbled as if his bones were falling apart and tumbled into the trough. In one swift instant, the blood dissolved his flesh, and he was gone. Covenant groaned helplessly, A mock! Through the blur of his own ineffectual tears, he gaped at the red flowing rill of earth blood. Imbalance poured into him from the stone, mounted in his muscles like vertigo. He lost all sense of where he was. To steady himself, he reached out to grasp Elena's shoulder. Her shoulder was so hard and intense, so full of rigid purpose, that it felt like naked bone under the fabric of her robe. She was poised on the verge of her own climax. Her passion was tangible to his touch. It appalled him. Despite the dizziness which anchored his mind, he located the source of the nameless reek of wrong. The ill was in Elena, in the High Lord herself. She seemed unconscious of it. In a tone of barely controlled excitement, she said, Amok is gone. His purpose is accomplished. Now there must be no more delay. For the sake of all the earth, I must drink and command. To Covenant's ears, she sounded rife with hungry conclusions, so packed with needs and duties and intents that she was about to shatter. The realization caught him like a damp hand on the back of his neck, forced him inwardly to his knees. When she stepped out of his grasp, moved towards the trough of blood, he felt that she had torn away his last defense. Elena! He wailed silently. Elena! His cries were cries of abjection. For a moment he knelt within himself, as if he were in the grip of a vision. Dizzily he saw all the manifest ways in which he was responsible for Elena, all the ways in which he had caused her to be who and what and where she was. His duplicity was the cause, his violence, his futility, his need. And he remembered the apocalypse hidden in her gaze. That was the ill. It made him shudder in anguish. He watched her through his blur of tears. When he saw her bend towards the trough, all of him leaped up in defiance of the slick rock and cried out hoarsely, Elena, don't! Don't do it! The High Lord stopped. But she did not turn. The whole rigor of her back condensed into one question. Why? Don't you see it? he gasped. This is all some plot of fowls. We're being manipulated. You're being manipulated. Something terrible is going to happen. For a time she remained silent while he ached. Then, in a tone of austere conviction, she said, I cannot let pass this chance to serve the land. I am forewarned. If this is Fang Thane's best ploy to defeat us, it is also our best means to strike at him. I do not fear to measure my will against his. And I hold the staff of law. Have you not learned that the staff is unsuited to his hands? He would not have delivered it to us if it were in any way adept for his uses. No, 
the staff warns me. Lord Fowl cannot contrive my vision. Your vision! Covenant extended his hands in pleading towards her. Don't you see what it is? Don't you see where it comes from? It comes from me. From that unholy bargain I made with the Ranian. A bargain that failed, Elena. Yet it would appear that you bargained better than you knew. The Ranian kept their promise. They gave in return more than you could either foresee or control. Her answer seemed to block his throat, and into his silence she said, What has altered you, unbeliever? Without your help, we would not have gained this place. On Riven Rock you gave aid without stint or price, though my own anger imperiled you. Yet now you delay me. Thomas Covenant, you are not so craven. Craven? Hellfire, I'm a bloody coward! Some of his rage returned to him, and he spluttered through the sweat and tears that ran into his mouth. All lepers are cowards! We have to be! At last she turned towards him, faced him with the focus, the blazing holocaust of her gaze. Its force ripped his balance away from him, and he sprawled in fragments on the stone. But he pushed himself up again. Driven by his fear of her and for her, he dared to confront her power. He stood tenuously and abandoned himself, took his plunge. Manipulation, Elena, he rasped. I'm talking about manipulation. Do you understand what that means? It means using people twisting them to suit purposes they haven't chosen for themselves. Manipulation. Not fouls. Mine. I've been manipulating you, using you. I told you I'd made another bargain, but I didn't tell you what it is. I've been using, using you to get myself off the hook. I promised myself that I would do everything I could to help you find this ward. And in return, I promised myself that I would do everything I could to make you take my responsibility. I watched you and helped you so that when you got here, you would look exactly like that. So you would challenge Fowl yourself without stopping to think about what you're doing. So that whatever happens to the land would be your fault instead of mine. So that I could escape. Hell in blood, Elena, do you hear me? Fowl is going to get us for sure. She seemed to hear only part of what he said. She bent her searing focus straight into him and said, Was there ever a time when you loved me? In an agony of protest, he half screamed, Of course I loved you! Then he mastered himself, put all his strength back into his appeal, it never even occurred to me that I might be able to use you until... until after the landslide. When I began to understand what you're capable of. I loved you before that. I love you now. I'm just an unconscionable bastard. And I used you, that's all. Now I regret it. With all the resources of his voice, he beseeched her... Elena, please don't drink that stuff. Forget the power of command and go back to Revelstone. Let the council decide what to do about all this. But the way in which her gaze left his face and burned around the walls of the cave told him that he had not reached her. When she spoke, she only confirmed his failure. I would be unworthy of lordship if I failed to act now. Amuk offered us a seventh ward because he perceived that the land's urgent needs surpassed the conditions of his creation. Fang Thane is upon the land now. He wages war now. Land and life and all are endangered now. While any power or weapon lies within my grasp, I will not permit him. Her voice softened as she added, And if you have loved me, how can I fail to strive for your escape? You need not have bargained in secret. 
I love you. I wish to serve you. Your regret only strengthens what I must do. Swinging back towards the trough, she raised the staff's guttering flame high over her head and shouted like a war cry, Melancurian Abatha! Ward yourself well, Fang Fane! I seek to destroy you! Then she stooped to the earth blood. Covenant struggled frantically in her direction, but his feet scattered out from under him again, and he went down with a crash like a shock of incapacity. As she lowered her face to the trough, he shouted, That's not a good answer! What happens to the oath of peace? But his cry did not penetrate her exaltation. Without hesitation, she took one steady sip of the blood and swallowed it. At once she leaped to her feet, stood erect and rigid as if she were possessed. She appeared to swell, expand like a distended icon. The fire of the staff ran down the wood to her hands. Instantly, her whole arm burst into flame. Elena! Covenant crawled towards her, but the might of her blue crackling blaze threw him back like a hard wind. He struck the tears from his eyes to see her more clearly. Within her enveloping fire, she was unharmed and savage. While the flame burned about her, enfolded her from head to foot in fiery searments, she raised her arms, lifted her face. For one fierce moment she stood motionless, trapped in conflagration. Then she spoke as if she were uttering words of flame. Come, I have tasted the earth blood. You must obey my will. The walls of death do not prevail. Kevin, son of Lorik, come. No, howled Covenant. No, don't. But even his inner cry was swamped by a great voice which shivered and groaned in the air so hugely that he seemed to hear it not with his ears, but with the whole surface of his body. Fool! Desist! Staggering waves of anguish poured from the voice. Do not do this! Kevin, hear me! Elena shouted back in a transported tone. You cannot refuse! The blood of the earth compels you. I have chosen you to meet my command. Kevin, come! The great voice repeated, Fool, you know not what you do. But an instant later, the ambiance of the cave changed violently, as if a tomb had opened into it. Breakers of agony rolled through the air. Covenant winced at every surge. He braced himself where he knelt and looked up. The specter of Kevin Lanwaster stood outlined in pale light before Elena. He dwarfed her, dwarfed the cave itself. Momentarily upright and desolate, he was visible through the stone rather than within the cave. He towered over Elena as if he were part of the very mountain rock. He had a mouth like a cut, eyes full of the effects of desecration, and on his forehead was a bandage which seemed to cover some mortal wound. Release me, he groaned. I have done harm enough for one soul. Then serve me, she cried ecstatically up to him. I offer you a command to redeem that harm. You are Kevin, son of Lorik, the waster of the land. You have known despair to its dregs. You have tasted the full cup of gall. That is knowledge and strength which no one living can equal. My Lord Kevin, I command you to battle and defeat Lord Fowl the Despiser. Destroy Fang Thane. By the power of the earth blood, I command you. The specter stared aghast at her and raised his fists as if he meant to strike her. Fool! he repeated terribly. The next instant, a concussion like the slamming of a crypt shook the cave. One last pulse of anguish pummeled the High Lord's party. Elena's flame was blown out like a weak candle. Darkness flooded the cave. 
Then Kevin was gone. A long time passed. When Covenant regained consciousness, he rested wearily for a while on his hands and knees, glad of the darkness and the reduced scale of the cave and the specter's absence. But eventually he remembered Elena. Pushing himself to his feet, he reached towards her with his voice. Elena! Come on, Elena! Let's get out of here! At first he received no response. Then blue fire flared as Elena lit the staff. She was sitting like a wreck on the floor. When she turned her wan-spent face towards him, he saw that her crisis was over. All the exaltation had been consumed by the act of command. He went to her, helped her gently to her feet. Come on, he said again. Let's go. She shook her head vaguely, and in an exhausted voice, He called me a fool. What have I done? I hope we never find out. A rough edge of sympathy made him sound harsh. He wanted to care for her, and did not know how. To give her time and privacy to gather her strength, he stepped away. As he glanced dully around the cave, he noticed Banner, noticed the faint look of surprise in Banner's face. Something in that unfamiliar expression gave Covenant a twist of apprehension. It seemed to be directed at him. He probed for an explanation by asking, That was Kevin, wasn't it? Banner nodded. The speculative surprise remained on his face. Well, at least it wasn't that beggar. At least now we know it wasn't Kevin who picked me for this. Still, Banner's gaze did not change. It made Covenant feel uncomfortably exposed, as if there was something indecent about himself that he did not realize. Confused, he turned back to the High Lord. Suddenly, a silent blast like a howl of stone jolted the cave, made it tremble and jump like an earthquake. Covenant and Elena lost their footing, slapped against the floor. Marin's warning shout echoed flatly, Kevin returns. Then the buried tomb of the air opened again. Kevin's presence resonated against Covenant's skin. But this time the specter brought with him a ghastly reek of rotten flesh and attar, and in the background of his presence was the deep rumble of rock being crushed. When Covenant raised his head from the bucking floor, he saw Kevin within the stone, furiously poised, fists cocked. Hot green filled the orbs of his eyes, sent rank steam curling up his forehead, and he dripped with emerald light, as if he had just struggled out of a quagmire. Fool! He cried in a paroxysm of anguish. Damned betrayer! You have broken the law of death to summon me. You have unleashed measureless opportunities for evil upon the earth, and the despiser mastered me as easily as if I were a child. The ill earth stone consumes me. Fight, fool! I am commanded to destroy you. Roaring like a multitude of fiends, he reached down and clutched at Elena. She did not move. She was aghast, frozen by the result of her great dare. But Marin reacted instantly, crying, Kevin, hold! He sprang to her aid. The specter seemed to hear Marin, hear and recognize who he was. An old memory touched Kevin, and he hesitated. That hesitation gave Marin time to reach Elena, thrust her behind him. When Kevin threw off his uncertainty, his fingers closed around Marin instead of the High Lord. He gripped the blood guard and heaved him into the air. Kevin's arm passed easily through the rock, but Marin could not. He crashed against the ceiling with tremendous force. The impact tore him from Kevin's grasp. 
but that impact was sufficient. The first mark fell dead like a broken twig. The sight roused Elena. At once, she realized the danger. She whirled the staff swiftly about her head. Its flame sprang into brilliance, and a hot blue bolt lashed straight at Kevin. The blast struck him like a physical blow, drove him back a step through the stone. But he shrugged off its effects. With a deep snarl of pain, he moved forward, snatched at her again. Shouting frantically, Melancurian Abatha! She met his attack with the staff. Its fiery heel seared his palm. Again he recoiled, gripping his scorched fingers and groaning. In that momentary reprieve, she cried strange invocations to the staff, and swung its blaze around her three times, surrounding herself with a shield of power. When the specter grabbed for her once more, he could not gain a hold on her. She squeezed her shield, and his fingers dripped with emerald ill, but he could not touch her. Whenever he dented her defense, she healed it with the staff's might. Yelling in frustration and pain, he changed his tactics. He reared back, clasped his fists together, and hammered them at the floor of the cave. The stone jumped fiercely. The lurch knocked Covenant down, threw Banner against the opposite wall. A gasping shudder like a convulsion of torment shot through the mountain. The cave walls heaved. Rumblings of broken stone filled the air. Power blared. A crack appeared in the floor directly under Elena. Even before she was aware of it, it started to open. Then, like ravenous jaws, it jerked wide. High Lord Elena dropped into the chasm. Kevin pounced after her and vanished from sight. His howls echoed out of the cleft like the shrieking of a madman. But even as they disappeared, their battle went on. Lord's fire spouted hotly up into the cave. The thunder of tortured stone pounded along the tunnel, and the cave pitched from side to side like a nausea in the guts of Melancurian sky weir. In this horror, Covenant thought that the whole edifice of the mountain was about to tumble. Then he was snatched to his feet, hauled erect by Banner. The bloodguard gripped him with compelling fingers and shouted at him through the tumult, Save her! I can't! The pain of his reply made him yell. Banner's demand rubbed so much salt into the wound of his essential futility that he could hardly bear it. I cannot! You must! Banner's grasp allowed no alternatives. How? Waving his empty hands in Banner's face, he cried, With these? Yes. The blood guard caught Covenant's left hand, forced him to look at it. On his wedding finger, his ring throbbed fearily, pulsed with power and light, like a potent instrument panting to be used. For an instant he gaped at the argent band, as if it had betrayed him. Then, forgetting escape, forgetting himself, forgetting even that he did not know how to exert wild magic, he pulled despairingly away from Banner and stumbled towards the crevice. Like a man battering himself in armless impotence against a blank doom, he leaped after the High Lord. Chapter 26 Gallows How. But he failed before he began. He did not know how to brace himself with the kind of battle which raged below him. As he passed the rim of the crevice, he was hit by a blast of force like an eruption from within the rift. He was defenseless against it. It snuffed out his consciousness like a frail flame. Then for a time he rolled in darkness ran in a blind, caterwauling void which pitched and broke over him until he staggered like a ship with sprung timbers. He was aware of nothing but the force which thrashed him. But something caught his hand, anchored him, 
At first he thought that the grip on his hand was Elena's, that she held him now as she had held him and kept him during the night after his summoning. But when he shook clear of the darkness, he saw a banner. The blood guard was pulling him out of the crevice. That sight, that perception of his failure, undid him. When Banner set him on his feet, he stood listing amid the riot of battle. Detonations, deep groaning creaks of tormented stone, loud rock falls, like an empty hulk. A cargoless hull sucking in death through a wound below its waterline. He did not resist or question as Banner half carried him from the cave of the earth blood. The tunnel was unlit except by the reflected glares of combat. But Banner moved surely over the black rock. In moments, he brought his shambling charge to the waterfall. There he lifted the unbeliever in his arms and bore him like a child through the weight of the falls. In the rock light of Earthroot, Banner moved even more urgently. He hastened to the waiting boat, installed Covenant on one of the seats, then leaped aboard as he shoved out into the burnished lake. Without hesitation, he began to recite something in the native tongue of the Harokai. Smoothly, the boat made its way among the cloistral columns. But his efforts did not carry the craft far. Within a few hundred yards, its prow began to tug against its intended direction. He stopped speaking, and at once the boat swung off to one side. Gradually, it gained speed. It was in the grip of a current, standing in the center of Covenant's sightless gaze. Banner cocked one eyebrow slightly, as if he perceived an ordeal ahead. For long moments he waited for the slow increase of the current to reveal its destination. Then in the distance he saw what caused the current. Far ahead of the craft, rock light flared along a line in the lake like a cleft which stretched out of sight on both sides. Into this cleft, Earthroot rushed and poured in silent cataracts. He reacted with smooth efficiency, as if he had been preparing for this test throughout the long centuries of his service. First he snatched a coil of Klingor from his pack. With it, he lashed Covenant to the boat. In answer to the vague question in Covenant's face, he replied, The battle of Kevin and the High Lord has opened a crevice in the floor of Earthroot. We must ride the water down and seek an outlet below. He did not wait for a response. Turning, he braced his feet, gripped one of the gilt gunnels, and tore it loose. With this long, curved piece of wood balanced in his hands for a steering pole, he swung around to gauge the boat's distance from the cataract. The hot line of the crevice was less than a hundred yards away now and the boat slipped rapidly towards it, caught in the mounting suction. But Banner made one more preparation. Bending towards Covenant, he said quietly, Er, Lord, you must use the Orcrest. His voice echoed with authority through the silence. Covenant stared at him without comprehension. You must. It is in your pocket. Bring it out. For a moment, Covenant continued to stare but at last the blood guard's command reached through his numbness. Slowly, he dug into his pocket, pulled out the smooth, lucid stone. He held it awkwardly in his right hand, as if he could not properly grip it with only two fingers and a thumb. The cataract loomed directly before the boat now, but Banner spoke calmly, firmly. Hold the stone in your left hand. Hold it above your head so that it will light our way. As Covenant placed the oar crest in contact with his troubled ring, a piercing silver light burst from the core of the stone. It flared along the gunnel in Banner's hands, paled the surrounding rock light. When Covenant numbly raised his fist, held the stone up like a torch, the blood guard nodded his approval. His face wore a look of satisfaction as if all the conditions of his vow had been fulfilled. Then the prow of the boat dropped. 
Banner and Covenant rode the torrent of earth root into the dark depths. The water boiled and heaved wildly, but one end of the crevice opened into other caverns. The cataracts turned as they fell and thrashed through the crevice as if it were an immense chute or channel. By the orcrest light, Banner saw in time which way the water poured. He pulled the boat so that it shot downward along the torrent. After that, the craft hurtled down the frenetic watercourse in a long nightmare of tumult, jagged rocks, narrows, sudden heart-stopping falls, close death. The current tumbled, thundered, raced from cavern to cavern through labyrinthian gaps and tunnels and clefts in the fathomless bowels of Melancurian Skyweir. Many times the craft disappeared under the fierce royal of the rush, but each time its potent wood, wood capable of withstanding earth root, bore it to the surface again. And many times Banner and Covenant foundered in cascades that crashed onto them from above. But the water did not harm them. Either it had lost its strength in the fall, or it was already diluted by other buried springs and lakes. Through it all, Covenant held his oar crest high. Some last unconscious capacity for endurance kept his fingers locked and his arm raised and the stone's unfaltering fire lighted the boat's way, so that, even in the sharpest hysteria of the current, Banner was able to steer, avoid rocks and backwaters, fend around curves, preserve himself and the unbeliever. The torrent's violence soon splintered his pole, but he replaced it with the other gunwale. When that was gone, he used a seat board as a rudder. Straining and undaunted, he brought the voyage through its final crisis. Without warning, the boat shot down a huge flow into a cavern that showed no exit. The water frothed viciously, seeking release, and the air pressure mounted, became more savage every instant. A swift eddy caught the craft, swung it around and under the massive pour of water. Helplessly, the boat was driven down. Banner clawed his way to Covenant. He wrapped his legs around Covenant's waist, snatched the oar crest from him. Clutching the stone as if to sustain himself with it, Banner clamped his other hand over Covenant's nose and mouth. He held that position as the boat sank. The plunging weight of water thrust them straight under. Pressure squeezed them until Banner's eyes pounded in their sockets, and his ears yowled as if they were about to rupture. He could feel Covenant screaming in his grasp but he held his grip in the extremity of the last faithfulness, clung to the bright strength of the oar crest with one hand, and kept Covenant from breathing with the other. Then they were sucked into a side tunnel, an outlet. Immediately all the pressure of the trapped air and water hurled them upward. Covenant went limp. Banner's lungs burned but he retained enough alertness to swing himself upright as the water burst free. In a high, arcing spout, it carried the two men into the cleft of Revan Rock and sent them shooting out into the open morning of the Black River and garroting deep. For a moment, sunshine and free sky and forest reeled around Banner, and flares of released pressure staggered across his sight. Then the fortitude of his vow returned. Wrapping both arms around Covenant, he gave one sharp jerk which started the unbeliever's lungs working again. With a violent gasp, Covenant began breathing rapidly, feverishly. Some time passed before he showed any signs of consciousness. Yet all the while his ring throbbed as if it were sustaining him. Finally he opened his eyes and looked at Banner. At once he started to struggle weakly in his Klingor bonds. Banner appeared to him like one of the jinn who watches over the accursed. But then he lapsed. He recognized where he was, how he had arrived there, what he had left behind. He went on staring nakedly while Banner untied the lines which lashed him to the boat. Over the blood guard's shoulder he could see the great cliff of Rivenrock 
and behind it Melancurian Skyweir, shrinking as the boat scudded downriver. From the cleft, turgid black smoke broke upward in gouts sporadically emphasized by battle flashes deep within the mountains. Muffled blasts of anguish rent the gut rock, wreaking havoc in the very grave of the ages. Covenant felt he was floating away on a wave of ravage and destruction. Fearfully, he looked down at his ring. To his dismay, he found that it still throbbed like an exclamation of purpose. Instinctively, he clasped his right hand over it, concealed it. Then he faced forward in the boat, turned away from Banner and Riven Rock as if to protect his shame from scrutiny. He sat huddled there, weak and staring dismally, throughout the swift progress of the day. He did not speak to Banner, did not help him bail out the boat, did not look back. The current spewing from Riven Rock raised the Black River to near flood levels, and the light earthroot craft rode the rush intrepidly between glowering walls of forest. The morning sun glittered and danced off the dark water into Covenant's eyes, but he stared at it without blinking, as if even the protective reflex of his eyelids were exhausted. And after that, nothing interfered with his sightless vision. The sodden food which Banner offered to him he ate automatically, with his left hand concealed between his thighs. Midday and afternoon passed unrecognized, and when evening came he remained crouched on his seat, clenching his ring against his chest as if to protect himself from some final stab of realization. Then, as dusk thickened about him, he became aware of the music. The air of the deep was full of humming, a voiceless song, an eldritch melody which seemed to arise like passion from the faint throats of all the leaves. It contrasted sharply with the distant storming climacteric of Melancurian Skyweir, the song of violence which beat and shivered out of Riven Rock. Gradually he raised his head to listen. The deep song had an inflection of sufferance, as if it were deliberately restraining a potent melodic rage, sparing him. In the light of Orcrest, he saw that Banner was guiding the boat towards a high treeless hill, which rose against the night sky close to the south bank. The hill was desolate, bereft of life, as if its capacity to nourish even the hardiest plants had been irremediably scalded out of it. Yet it seemed to be the source of the deep song. The melody which rafted riverward from the hill sounded like a host of gratified furies, he regarded the hill incuriously. He had no strength left to care about such places. All his wanning sanity was focused on the sounds of battle from Melancurian Skyweir, and on the grip which concealed his ring. When Banner secured the boat and took hold of his right elbow to help him ashore, Covenant leaned on the bloodguard and followed his guidance woodenly. Banner went to the barren hill. Without question, Banner began to struggle up it. Despite his weariness, the hill impinged upon his awareness. He could feel its deadness with his feet, as if he were shambling up a corpse. Yet it was eager death. Its atmosphere was thick with the slaughter of enemies. Its incarnate hatred made his joints ache as he climbed it. He began to sweat and tremble, as if he were carrying the weight of an atrocity on his shoulders. Then near the hilltop Banner stopped him. The bloodguard lifted the oar crest. In its light, Covenant saw the gibbet beyond the crest of the hill. A giant dangled from it. And between him and the gibbet, staring at him as if he were a concentrated nightmare, were people people whom he knew. Lord Mahoram stood there erect in his battle-grimed robe. He clasped his staff in his left hand, and his lean face was taut with vision. Behind him were Lord Calendril and two bloodguard. The Lord had a dark look of failure in his soft eyes. 
Quan and Amorine were with him. And on Mahoram's right, supported by the Lord's right hand, was Heil Troy. Troy had lost his sunglasses and headband. The eyeless skin of his skull was knotted as if he were straining to see. He cocked his head, moved it from side to side to focus his hearing. Covenant understood intuitively that Troy had lost his land-born sight. With these people was one man whom Covenant did not know. He was the singer, a tall, white-haired man with glowing silver eyes, who hummed to himself as if he were doing the ground with melody. Covenant guessed without thinking that he was Care Royal Wildwood, the forestall of Garroding Deep. Something in the singer's gaze, something severe yet oddly respectful, recalled the unbeliever to himself. At last he perceived the fear in the faces watching him. He pushed himself away from Banner's support, took the weight of all his burdens on his own shoulders. For a moment he met the trepidation before him with a glare so intense that it made his forehead throb. But then, as he was about to speak, a fierce detonation from Riven Rock shook his bones, knocked him off balance. When he reached towards Banner, he exposed the shame of his ring. Facing Mahorm and Troy as squarely as he could, he groaned, She's lost. I lost her. But his face twisted, and the words came brokenly between his lips, like fragments of his heart. His utterance seemed to pale the music, making the muffled clamor from Riven Rock louder. He felt every blast of the battle like an internal blow. But the deadness under his feet became more and more vivid to him, and the gibbeted giant hung before him with an immediacy he could not ignore. He began to realize that he was facing people who had survived ordeals of their own. He flinched, but did not fall, when their protests began. When Troy gave a strangled cry, Lost? Lost? And Mahoram asked in a stricken voice, What has happened? Under the night sky on the lifeless hilltop, lit by the stars and the twin gleams of Care Royal Wildwood's eyes and the Orcrest fire, Covenant stood braced on banner like a crippled witness against himself, and described in stumbling sentences High Lord Elena's plight. He made no mention of the focus of her gaze, her consuming passion but he told all the rest. His bargain, a muck's end, the summoning of Kevin Lanwaster, Elena's solitary fall. When he was done, he was answered by an aghast silence that echoed in his ears like a denunciation. I'm sorry, he concluded into the stillness, forcing himself to drink the bitter dregs of his personal inefficacy, he added, I loved her. I would have saved her if I could. Loved her, Troy murmured. Alone? His voice was too disjointed to register the degree of his pain. Lord Mahorm abruptly covered his eyes, bowed his head. Quan, Amorine, and Calendril stood together as if they could not endure what they had heard alone. Another blast from Riven Rock shivered the air, it snatched Mahorm's head up, and he faced Covenant with tears streaming down his cheeks. It is as I have said, he breathed achingly. Madness is not the only danger in dreams. At this, Covenant's face twisted again. But he had nothing more to say. Even the release of assent was denied him. However, Banner seemed to hear something different in the Lord's tone. As if to correct an injustice, he went to Mahoram. As he moved, he took from his pack Covenant's marrow meld sculpture. He handed the work to Mahoram. The High Lord gave it to him as a gift. Lord Mahoram gripped the bone sculptor tightly, and his eyes shone with sudden comprehension. He understood the bond between Elena and the Ranihan. He understood what the giving of such a gift to Covenant meant. 
a gasp of weeping swept over his face. But when it passed, it left his self-mastery intact. His crooked lips took on their own humane angle. When he turned to Covenant again, he said gently, It is a precious gift. Banner's unexpected support and Mahorm's gesture of conciliation touched Covenant, but he had no strength to spare for either of them. His gaze was fixed on Heil Troy. The war mark winced eyelessly under repeated blows of realization, and within him a gale brewed. He seemed to see Elena in his mind, remember her, taste her beauty, savor all the power of sight which she had taught him. He seemed to see her useless solitary end. Lost, he panted as his fury grew. Lost? Alone? All at once he erupted. With a livid howl he raged at Covenant. Do you call that love? Leper? Unbeliever? He spat the words, as if they were the most damning curses he knew. All of this is just a game for you. Mental tricks. Excuses. You're a leper. A moral leper. You're too selfish to love anyone but yourself. You have the power for everything and you won't use it. You just turned your back on her when she needed you. You despicable leper! Leper! He shouted with such force that the muscles on his neck corded. The veins in his temples bulged and throbbed as if he were about to burst with execration. Covenant felt the truth of the accusation. His bargain exposed him to such charges— and Troy hit the heart of his vulnerability as if some prophetic insight guided his blindness. Covenant's right hand twitched in a futile fending motion, but his left clung to his chest, as if to localize his shame in that one place. When Troy paused to gather himself for another assault, Covenant said weakly, Unbelief has got nothing to do with it. She was my daughter. What? My daughter. Covenant pronounced it like an indictment. I raped Trell's child. Elena was his granddaughter. Your daughter? Troy was too stunned to shout. Implications like glimpses of depravity rocked him. He groaned, as if Covenant's crimes were so multitudinous that he could not hold them all in his mind at once. Mahorm spoke to him carefully. My friend, this is the knowledge which I have withheld from you. The withholding gave you unintended pain. Please pardon me. The council feared that this knowledge would cause you to abominate the unbeliever. Damn right, Troy panted. Damn right. Suddenly his accumulated passion burst into action. Guided by sure instinct, he reached out swiftly, snatched away Lord Mahorm's staff. He spun once to gain momentum and leveled a crushing blow with the staff at Covenant's head. The unexpectedness of the attack surpassed even Banner. But he recovered, sprang after Troy, jolted him enough to unbalance his swing. As a result, only the heel of the staff clipped Covenant's forehead. But that sent him tumbling backward down the hill. He caught himself, got to his knees. When he raised a hand to his head, he found that he was bleeding profusely from a wound in the center of his forehead. He could feel old hate and death seeping into him from the blasted earth. Blood ran down his cheeks like spittle. The next moment, Mahorm and Quan reached Troy. Mahorm tore the staff from his grasp. Quan pinned his arms. Fool! The Lord rasped. You forget the oath of peace. Loyalty is due. Troy struggled against Quan. Rage and anguish mottled his face. I haven't sworn any oath. Let go of me. You are the war mark of the war ward. 
said Mahoram dangerously. The oath of peace binds. But if you cannot refrain from murder for that reason, refrain because the despiser's army is destroyed. Flesh harrower hangs dead on the gibbet of Gallows Howe. Do you call that victory? We've been decimated. What good is a victory that costs so much? Troy's fury rose like weeping. It would have been better if we'd lost. Then it wouldn't have been such a waste. The passion in his throat made him gasp for air, as if he were asphyxiating on the reek of Covenant's perfidy. But Lord Mahoram was unmoved. He caught Troy by the breastplate and shook him. Then refrain because the High Lord is not dead. Not dead. Troy panted. Not dead? We hear her battle even now. Do you not comprehend the sound? Even as we listen, she struggles against dead Kevin. The staff sustains her, and he has not the might she believed of him. But the proof of her endurance is here, in the unbeliever himself. She is his summoner. He will remain in the land until her death. So it was when Drool Rockworm first called him. She's still fighting? Troy gaped at the idea. He seemed to regard it as the conclusive evidence of Covenant's treachery. But then he turned to Mahoram and cried, We've got to help her! At this Mahoram flinched. A wave of pain broke through his face. In a constricted voice he asked, How? How? Troy fumed. Don't ask me how. You're the Lord. We have got to help her. The Lord pulled himself erect, clenched his staff for support. We are fifty leagues from Ribbon Rock. A night and a day would pass before any Ranihin could carry us to the foot of the cliff. Then Banner would be required to guide us into the mountain in search of the battle. Perhaps the effects of the battle have destroyed all approaches to it. Perhaps they would destroy us. Yet if we gain the High Lord, we would have nothing to offer her but the frail strength of two lords. With the staff of law she far surpasses us. How can we help her? They faced each other as if they met mind to mind across Troy's eyelessness. Mahorm did not falter under the war mark's rage. The hurt of his inadequacy showed clearly in his face, but he neither denied nor cursed at his weakness. Though Troy trembled with urgency, he had to take his demand elsewhere. He swung towards Covenant. You! he shouted stridently. If you're too much of a coward to do anything yourself, at least give me a chance to help her. Give me your ring! I can feel it from here. Give it to me. Come on, you bastard, it's your only chance. Kneeling on the dead, sabulous dirt of the how, Covenant looked up at Troy through the blood in his eyes. For a time, he was unable to answer. Troy's adjuration seemed to drop on him like a rockfall. It swept away his last defense and left bare his final shame. He should have been able to save Elena. He had the power. It pulsed like a wound on his wedding finger. But he had not used it. Ignorance was no excuse. His claim of futility no longer covered him. The barren atmosphere of the how ached in his chest as he climbed to his feet. Though he could hardly see where he was going, he started up the hill. The exertion made his head hurt as if there were splinters of bone jabbing his brain, and his heart quivered. A silent voice cried out to him, No! No! But he ignored it. With his half-hand he fumbled at the ring. It seemed to resist him. He had trouble gripping it. But as he reached Troy, he finally tore it from his finger. In a wet voice, as if his mouth were full of blood, he said, Take it! Save her! He put the band in Troy's hand. The touch of the pulsing ring exalted Troy. Clenching his fingers around it, he turned, ran fearlessly to the hill crest. 
He searched quickly with his ears, located the direction of Riven Rock, faced the battle. Like a titan, he swung his fist at the heavens. Power flamed from the white gold as if it were answering his passion. In a livid voice, he cried, Elena! Elena! Then the tall white singer was at his side. The music took on a forbidding note that spread involuntary status like a mist over the hilltop. Everyone froze, lost the power of movement. In the stillness, Care Royal Wildwood lifted his gnarled scepter. No, he trilled. I cannot permit this. It is a breaking of law. And you forget the price that is owed to me. Perhaps when you have gained an incondign mastery over the wild magic, you will use it to recant the price. With his scepter, he touched Troy's upraised fist. The ring dropped to the ground. As it fell, all the heat and surge of its power faded. It looked like mere metal as it struck the lifeless earth, rolled lightly along the music, and stopped near Covenant's feet. I will not permit it, the singer continued. The promise is irrevocable. In the names of the one tree and the one forest, in the name of the unforgiving deep, I claim the price of my aid. With a solemn gesture like the sound of distant horns, he touched his scepter to Troy's head. Eyeless one, you have promised payment. I claim your life. Lord Mahorm strove to protest, but the singer's status held him. He could do nothing but watch as Troy began to change. I claim you to be my disciple, the singer hummed. You shall be Care Caveral, my help and hold. From me you shall learn the work of a forestal, root and branch, seed and sap and leaf and all. Together we will walk the deep, and I will teach you the songs of the trees and the names of all the old brave wakeful woods and the ancient forestry of thought and mood. While trees remain... We will steward together, cherishing each new sprout, and wreaking wood's revenge on each hated human intrusion. Forget your foolish friend. You cannot succor her. Care Caveral, remain and serve. The song molded Troy's form. Slowly his legs grew together. His feet began to send roots into the soil. His apparel turned to thick, dark moss. He became an old stump with one last limb upraised. From his fist, green leaves uncurled. Softly, the singer concluded, Together we will restore life to Gallows Howe. Then he turned towards the lords and covenant. The silver brilliance of his eyes increased, dimming even the orcrest fire and he sang in a tone of dewy freshness, Axe and fire leave me dead. I know the hate of hands grown bold. Depart to save your heart saps red. My hate knows neither rest nor weal. As the words fluted through them, he disappeared into the music, as if he had wrapped it about him and passed beyond the range of sight but the warning melody lingered behind him like an echo in the air. Repeating his command, and repeating it until it could not be forgotten. Gradually, like figures lumbering stiffly out of a dream, the people on the hilltop began to move again. Quan and Amorine hastened to the mossy stump. Grief filled their faces, but they had endured too much struggled too hard in their long ordeal. They had no strength left for horror or protest. Amorine stared as if she could not comprehend what had happened, and tears glistened in Quan's old eyes. He called, Hail, Warmark. 
but his voice sounded weak and dim on the how, and he said no more. Behind them, Lord Mahoram sagged. His hands trembled as he held up his staff in a mute farewell. Lord Calendril joined him, and they stood together as if they were leaning on each other. Covenant dropped numbly to his knees to pick up his ring. He reached for it like an acolyte bending his forehead to the ground, and when his fingers closed on it, he slid it into place on his wedding finger. Then, with both hands, he tried to wipe the blood out of his eyes. But as he made the attempt, a blast from Riven Rock staggered the air. The mountain groaned as if it were grievously wounded. The concussion threw him on his face in the dirt. Blackness filled the remains of his sight as if it were flooding into him from the barren howl, and behind it he heard the blast howling like the livid triumph of fiends. A long tremor passed through the deep, and after it came an extended shattering sound, as if the whole cliff of Riven Rock were crumbling. People moved, voices called back and forth, but Covenant could not hear them clearly. His ears were deluged by tumult, a yammering, multitudinous yell of glee. And the sound came closer. It became louder and more immediate until it overwhelmed his eardrums, passed beyond the range of physical perception, and shrieked directly into his brain. After that, voices reached him obscurely, registered somehow through his overdriven hearing. Banner said, Riven Rock bursts. There will be a great flood. Lord Calendril said, Some good will come of it. It will do much to cleanse the white warns under Mount Thunder. Lord Mahoram said, Behold, the unbeliever departs. The High Lord has fallen. But these things surpassed him. He could not hold on to them. The black dirt of Gallows Howl loomed in his face like an incarnation of midnight, and around it, encompassing it, consuming both it and him, the fiendish scream scaled upward, filling his skull and chest and limbs as if it were grinding his very bones to powder. The howl overcame him, and he answered with a cry that made no sound. Chapter 27 Leper The shriek climbed, became louder as it grew more urgent and damaging. He could feel it breaking down the barriers of his comprehension, altering the terrain of his existence. Finally he seemed to shatter against it. He fell against it from a great height, so that he broke on its remorseless surface. He jerked at the force of the impact. When he lay still again, he could feel the hardness pressing coldly against his face and chest. Gradually, he realized that the surface was damp, sticky. It smelled like clotting blood. That perception carried him across a frontier. He found that he could distinguish between the flat, bitter, insulting shriek outside and the ragged hurt inside his head. With an agonizing effort, he moved one hand to rub the caked blood out of his eyes. Then torturously he opened them. His vision swam into focus like a badly smeared lens. But after a while he began to make out pieces of where he was. There was plenty of soulless yellow light. The legs of the sofa stood a few feet away across the thick defensive carpet. He was lying prostrate on the floor beside the coffee table, as if he had fallen off a cataphlac. With his left hand he clutched something hard to his ear, something that shrieked brutally. When he shifted his head, he discovered that he was holding the receiver of the telephone. From it came the shriek, the piercing wail of a phone left off its hook. The phone itself lay on the floor just out of reach. 
A long, dumb moment passed before he regained enough of himself to wonder how long ago Joan had hung up on him. Groaning, he rolled to one side and looked up at a wall clock. He could not read it. His eyes were still too blurred. But through one window he could see the first light of an uncomfortable dawn. He had been unconscious for half the night. He started to his feet, then slumped down again while pain rang in his head. He feared that he would lose consciousness once more. But after a while, the noise cleared, faded into the general scream of the phone. He was able to get to his knees. He rested there, looking about him at the controlled orderliness of his living room. Joan's picture and his cup of coffee stood just where he had left them on the table. The jolt of his head on the table edge had not even spilled the coffee. The sanctuary of the familiar place gave him no consolation. When he tried to concentrate on the room's premeditated neatness, his gaze kept sliding back to the blood, dry, almost black, which crusted the carpet. That stain violated his safety like a chanker. To get away from it, he gripped himself and climbed to his feet. The room reeled as if he had fallen into vertigo, but he steadied himself on the padded arm of the sofa, and after a moment he regained most of his balance. Carefully, as if he were afraid of disturbing a demon, he placed the receiver back on its hook, then sighed deeply as the shriek was chopped out of the air. Its echo continued to ring in his left ear. It disturbed his equilibrium, but he ignored it as best he could. He began to move through the house like a blind man, working his way from support to support, sofa to door frame to kitchen counter. Then he had to take several unbraced steps to reach the bathroom, but he managed to cross the distance without falling. He propped himself on the sink and rested again. When he had caught his breath, he automatically ran water and lathered his hands. The first step in his rite of cleansing, a vital part of his defense against a relapse— for a time he scrubbed his hands without raising his head. But at last he looked into the mirror. The sight of his own visage stopped him. He gazed at himself out of raw, self-inflicted eyes and recognized the face that Elena had sculpted. She had not placed a wound on the forehead of her carving, but his cut only completed the image she had formed of him. He could see a gleam of bone through the caked black blood which darkened his forehead and cheeks, spread down around his eyes, emphasizing them, shadowing them with terrible purposes. The wound and the blood on his gray, gaunt face made him look like a false prophet, a traitor to his own best dreams. Elena, he cried thickly, what have I done? Unable to bear the sight of himself, he turned away and glanced numbly around the bathroom. In the fluorescent lighting, the porcelain of the tub and the chromed metal of its dangerous fixtures glinted as if they had nothing whatever to do with weeping. Their blank superficiality seemed to insist that grief and loss were unreal, irrelevant. He stared at them for a long time, measuring their blankness. Then he limped out of the bathroom. Grimly, deliberately, he left his forehead uncleaned, untouched. He did not choose to repudiate the accusation written there. That is the end of The Ill Earth War, by Stephen Donaldson, and read by John Chancer. By John Chancer.